Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm gonna go back and make sure there's nobody um, here. Oh, it says, it says live on Facebook, so you must yeah. have seen it, yeah. Okay, good. So I'll just mute everyone so that, um, you know, if you move or something, we don't hear you. <laughs> And because uh, sometimes it switches, you know, to whoever's making noise, and sometimes that could just be a, a light little touch your laptop. So welcome everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, as I say, I'll have to keep going back and forth in case other people are trying to get in. But hope, hang on, somebody. Yep, hopefully we'll move through it. So this season, you know, we started this last year, and as you probably remember, <laughs> COVID interrupted us, so we were closed for five months without a Zoom account, and. I ended up kind of changing how I wanted to do this. Originally, I wanted to do a, a more or less blow by blow account of how the war progressed in Ireland under different kind of factions. So we were going to do the timeline, you know, and follow the the actual days of, you know. So we're going back to that format today anyway. February, we might change it up because there's a, a guest speaker coming. But a lot happened in January of 1921. Um, you probably remember from our last one in December, you know, de Valera had returned home after a pretty tumultuous stay in the country here. Um, so violence is ratcheting up on both sides in 1921. And the IRA kind of also begin, a, well, continue, you could say, a campaign of intimidation against anyone that they saw as spies, including from among their own rank ranks, not just, you know, RIC or British Army officers. The press and other outside agencies were now covering the war more, and so there was external pressure being brought to bear on Lloyd George and the politicians on both sides to reach some sort of solution. Despite not achieving recognition at the conference at, at Versailles um, to, you know, get Ireland's nationalism and sovereignty recognised, and having been largely ignored by Wilson while he was in America, de Valera did succeed in getting a lot of publicity while he was here. At the same time, However, now the church in Ireland, uh, despite some people being very involved, like Father Flanagan, uh, they go on the record in January as being opposed to the violence. And throughout this, of course, Sinn Féin are worried about what was happening up north because the Government of Ireland Act had passed and partition was happening. So tonight I'm going to try and cover those strains uh, more or less in order. The new year got off to a violent start in both Monaghan and Cork, uh, New Year's Day. Four policemen from Valley Bay in Monaghan were patrolling Main Street when they were attacked by armed men from gateways on either side of the street. The patrol returned fire and were reinforced by a further three officers from the local barracks. Uh, this fight between police and attackers was a prolonged one and the police in fact ran out of ammunition. Three remaining policemen up at the barracks sent up flare lights to indicate that they needed assistance. These signals were seen in Dundalk, 24 miles away, and an RIC military um, force combined in two crossy tenders was dispatched. When the reinforcements passed through Castle Blaney, they were stopped and informed that an ambush party of 200 IRA men was entrenched on the main road three miles from Bally Bay. And so they left the vehicles in Castle Blaney and proceeded on foot the eight miles to Bally Bay. On their arrival, they found the body of Constable Malone lying dead on Main Street. He had been killed by a gunshot to the right side of the face and um, probably buckshot. He was almost unrecognizable. Close by the body of a dead civilian called Somerville was, was found. He was also from Valley Bay. Three auxiliary policemen were wounded, one of them sustaining a bad eye injury, and those injured officers were moved to Louth, uh, to the infirmary there. After this incident, six men were arrested and taken to Monaghan. One of them had a severe head wound when he was arrested. Uh, in June of 1921, 10 of these men were charged at a general court martial in Victoria Barracks in Belfast uh, with the death of the constable. Constable Malone was a 30 year old bachelor, a first world war veteran, and he was from County Westmeath. He would have been uh, on the service for one year. Um, he had been a clerk and a soldier before joining the RIC. So Monaghan and Armagh both saw trouble again later in January. So that was New Year's Day. Uh, three more policemen were ambushed and killed after they left Leonard's public house in Corcoran. Philip Marin recalled that the police had been acting in a blackguardly manner, searching local homes and causing general mayhem. An IRA officer was killed and another wounded after their 15 strong group fired on an RIC patrol, which interrupted their looting of a pub in Clonus. An IRA ambush was also mounted at Freeduff in County Armagh, 
two RIC men were killed and others injured. So we've kind of talked about this before that, you know, it's often the RIC who bear the brunt of the deaths, you know, as opposed to the black and tans or auxiliaries, uh, sometimes British soldiers too, but the, the main deaths were actually RIC policemen and many of whom were Irish. Um, so Middleton in County Cork then was also uh, severely burned, seven houses burned to the ground as a reprisal for the killing of three RIC officers. These houses were burned because alleged the town failed to report the planned ambush to authorities. The military governor ordered that specific houses were to be destroyed. So John O'Shea's home, Paul McCarthy, Edward Carey, the Cotter and Donovan families and Michael Dorgan as well as the Middleton garage and engineering works were burnt to the ground. Uh, there were no injuries, but, you know, this was a severe, you know, their homes were burnt. The British military forces issued a statement which was published in the Cork Examiner. Uh, farm machinery and a barn was damaged. And of course, destroying those kind of agricultural sector, like uh, the ones parked at the garage and engineering works, doesn't only terrorise the population, but it cripples the local economy. And so we see as the war progresses that creameries and that kind of thing are also targeted. Now, Dublin saw several violent events in January alone. Uh, don't forget, we've just kind of come from the Bloody Sunday events in November and then Kevin Barry's hanging in December. But the interesting thing was the difference between the city and the rural, you know, what's going on. So the rural kind of counter guerrilla operations that were taking place um, with these flying columns, very mobile groups, small fortified posts, was almost reminiscent, reminiscent of skirmishes um, that the British soldiers would have come across, you know, against the Boers in South Africa. But in Dublin, it was different because now it was an urban guerrilla insurgency. And of course, something that has become much more um, kind of regular in the 21st century. The insurgents in the cities did not hide in mountains or remote areas, but hid in plain sight among the civilian population. Combat was fleeting and the British forces overwhelming firepower was hardly ever brought to bear as it had been in Dublin 1916 during the Easter Rising. Uh, this becomes the bone of contention, of course, later on. Even stranger for the army was the fact that for decades, the British army had been a familiar, if not even welcome presence to some in Dublin city. You know, it was a very Anglo-Irish, Anglo-ascendancy city. Its transformation into an army of occupation as the question of Irish independence became a, an armed conflict must have come as a jarring shock to many of the British personnel. So of the 54 IRA men killed in Dublin between 1919 and 1921, only 16 were counted as killed in action. Uh, eight were formally executed, which means that 30 were kind of summarily executed. Um, now this is coming from the IRA figures. From late 1920 on, the IRA formed a full-time active service unit in the city with about 100 men divided into four sections, whose basically job it was, was to carry out at least three gun or bomb attacks a day. Later then in early 1921, the regular companies were ordered to patrol their allocated area and to fire on any police or troops that they encounter. Uh, okay. Um, now, particularly dangerous ambush spots for British forces were the Keys along the River Liffey and the Anger Street, Wexford Street thoroughfare, which was actually nicknamed the Dardanelles. The Crown forces were placed in a position in which most of their time was spent patrolling streets for anonymous guerrillas or the very tedious manning of checkpoints, checking civilians for weapons. Neither of these, of course, succeed in suppressing the small scale attacks, nor do they succeed in breaking up any IRA units. A nightly curfew was enforced at first from midnight to 5 a.m., but after Bloody Sunday in December from 10 p.m. Uh, and ultimately from 8 p.m. until 5 a.m. Troops were instructed that unauthorized persons found in the streets during curfew hours are liable to arrest, but are not liable to be shot unless seen to be carrying firearms. Uh, of course, that's kind of leaving it open to interpretation there. On the 13th of January, uh, British troops manning a checkpoint at O'Connell Bridge in Dublin opened fire on a crowd of civilians, killing two and seriously wounding five. On two occasions, whole blocks of the city, populated by thousands of people, were cordoned off, with no civilians allowed in or out until the area was searched by troops or police. The area around the four courts, for instance, was sealed off between the 15th and 17th of January and Mountjoy Square between 18th and 19th of February. 
Doors were broken down using tanks as battering rams, rooms were ransacked, and suspects were taken away for questioning. The results were largely indifferent. The British military reported, quote, Dublin is honeycombed with underground cellars and passages allowing sus suspects to escape. And so going forward, they limited actually the searches to two or three hours instead of two or three days. A British Army private, J.P. Swindlehurst, stationed in Dublin from January to February of 1921, recorded in his diary, Dublin seems to be a rotten place to be. People hurry along the streets, armoured cars dash up and down, bristling with machine guns. The men who style themselves as black and tans walk along like miniature arsenals. They dash about in cars with wire netting covering at all hours of the day, bent on some rapid reprisal or a capture of Sinn Féiners. One can sense the undercurrent of alarm and anxiety in the faces of the passers-by. So that was even, you know, the British Army kind of recognised that there's this undercurrent of terror because of the unpredictability of the, the, Shin, the auxiliaries and the Black and Tans. So one of the big skirmishes that happened in January was where eight young IRA volunteers and the Black and Tans kind of encountered each other at Tolka Bridge on the 21st of January. It was a Friday night. Uh, supposedly, the police received a tip off from a Sergeant Singleton in the Dublin Metropolitan Police. Um, so he kind of warned the British Army unit as they were approaching the bridge that they were going to, that the IRA were lying in wait for them. Uh, another man called Robert Pike from the same area kind of also told them. So the RIC motor lorries and an armoured car decided to kind of go around and surprise the IRA men instead, who subsequently fled into the fields and they were pursued and shot at, one being mortally wounded. Two men escaped and the rest were arrested and sentenced to death. Dermot O'Sullivan, who was only age 17 at the time, had his sentence commuted to life in prison because of his youth. Uh, one of the British Army officers' affidavits um, re oh, hang on, sorry, reads as follows. I am a district inspector in the Auxiliary Division of RIC, stationed at Dublin Castle. At about 10.30 on the 21st of January, in consequence of information received, um, I proceeded with a party of cadets along the Drumcondra Road in Dublin. Just before reaching Talca Bridge, a lorry laden with RIC constables passed me, going in the direction of Dublin City. One of the constables shouted a warning to be on our guard. On reaching a low wall bordering the allotments opposite St. Patrick's College, I saw five men in civilian clothes running away from the main road across the plots. Two men arose from behind the wall and ran. I heard a shot fired and I immediately fired at the running man who was nearest to me about 25 yards away. The man fell but got up and ran, whereupon I again fired, as did several of my men. The man fell to the ground and remained there. The wounded man gave me his name as Michael McGee and his address in North Circular Road. He stated that he was the section leader of A Company IRA. Now that man was very wounded in the thigh and they brought him in actually to some to those cottages and gave him a glass of water um, and took him away on a truck and apparently you know the street was covered with blood when they left so um <clears throat> this kind of brings us then to the ira actions in response to these various attacks now there were attacks all over the country clear uh, fecal was practically burnt to the ground you know there was a lot of different uh, military maneuvers throughout the country but the ira were particularly uh, you know kind of concerned with spies so given the previous role of spies and informers in compromising the Republican insurrections of 1798 and 1867, the IRA were very aware of the importance of stopping the flow of intelligence to the enemy by identifying and eliminating British agents. And we've talked about that with um, Michael Collins' squad. As a guerrilla army relying on secrecy and mobility, the IRA was rarely in a, pun in a position to punish suspected spies by holding them prisoner. And so the Republicans usually inflicted a variety of other punishments on these suspects. Some received threatening notices. In fact, many people you know, left the country. Others suffered economic boycott or were forced into exile. But in the most extreme cases, Republicans captured and killed civilians they claimed were spies or informers. In fact, a total of 196 civilians accused of spying were killed by the IRA during the war. The largest number of IRA executions occurred in Cork, where 78 alleged spies were executed by them. The second highest number occurred in Tipperary, where 16 civilians accused of spying were killed. The IRA in Dublin killed 13 civilians. Now, the overwhelming majority, 142 of these 196 civilians, 
were Catholic, uh, which is, you know, 72%, only 44 were Protestant, because there had been this kind of theory put around, you know, that the IRA used the war as a kind of cover for killing some, you know, powerful Protestants in, in smaller local areas, but that just isn't borne out. And so one of the executions by the IRA happened on the 8th of January in Tipperary. Thomas Kirby had been born in 1888 in the parish of Golden, um, very close to the Maltine River. He was the son of John and Ellen and had, and had three brothers and two sisters. He was a labourer by trade, but in November 1898, when he was 18, he enlisted in the Royal Irish Regiment and was given the regimental number 6486. He reported to the Royal Irish Regiment Depot in Conmel, and his medical examination records state that he was five foot eight tall with hazel eyes and brown hair. He had a number of scars on his face and body, aged 18 now. His religion was recorded as Roman Catholic and he was not married. Following a seven month period of training, Kirby was posted the, to the 1st Battalion on the 21st of July, 1898, which was based out of Buttevant in County Cork. But on the 20th of August, he deserted. Following a nine month absence, he apparently rejoined the depot at Clonmel and was convicted by a court martial immediately of desertion, fraudulent enlistment, and loosing by neglect. So he was sentenced to 84 days of hard labour. After serving his sentence, he was released to duty on the 6th of July. But by the 22nd of July, he was again awaiting trial for something. And um, he was discharged finally in May of 1900. And the British Army classified him as, quote, a harmless lunatic. So we don't know what his second crime was. Maybe he tried to desert again. But uh, he does not appear to have actually served with the British Army, even though he retained his uniform. So Tyg Dwyer, who was the com commandant of the 3rd Battalion in Tipperary, recorded his witness statement for the Bureau of Military History in 1959. He says, towards the end of 1920, it became clear to us that the British forces were getting information concerning the houses and places frequented by men on the run. An ex-British soldier named Thomas Kirby was suspected of spying and he was ordered to leave the area. He joined the British forces and returned to the barracks in Dundrum, Tipperary, I mean, from where he guided the enemy forces in their nightly prowls for wanted men. Although he disguised himself whenever he was out of the barracks with enemy parties, he was soon recognised. One night he ventured out alone and was followed and captured in a public house near Anacarty in Ballybrack, where he was drinking. He was tried by court martial and could give, could give no satisfactory explanation of his movements. To the charge of spying for the enemy forces, he pleaded insanity. Um, just want to make sure there's no one coming. Yeah. Sorry. He pleaded insanity. He was sentenced to death and was executed by a firing party. Before his death, we brought a priest to him who anointed him and gave him all spiritual aid. Um, we buried him in the hills near Ballybrack. Kirby's execution took place on or around the 8th of January 1921. So Kirby certainly was socialising with the army. Um, there were actually men from the regiment that he had originally joined stationed in the town, but he had never really served in the army. So whether or not, you know, he thought he was sharing information, he, he may well have been sharing information, um, you know, he was a very visible target if he was going in and out of the barracks, you know, in this small town. Now, the interesting thing here is his body was not found until 1990. So this is very interesting because later on, you know, the IRA have been associated with kind of the disappeared bodies. They weren't massively doing that uh, in 1921. So he was found dressed in a British Army uniform. And um, because the bog, you know, preserves the bodies, they actually thought for a while that he had, was only recently dead. So the inquest confirmed that the man was shot, you know, decades ago. From the trajectory of the bullets, it looks like he had been shot while stooping, probably digging his own grave. Uh, but the murder had happened in 1921. And so the IRA had never told, you know, his relatives where his body was. And I'll show you later on um, some of the new footage of that. Now, Lestole, which we talked about before because, well, it's my hometown, but also because they had had one of the first mutinies among the RIC to kind of the, the stricter surveillance that the British were um, asking, you know, these leaders to, um, to undertake. So in Lestole, the IRA shot RIC man Tobias O'Sullivan, who was from Galway and had replaced 
Jeremiah Mee and those other officers who'd taken part in the mutiny. The order to kill O'Sullivan came from General Headquarters in Dublin. Apparently, there was reluctance to carry out the order from the Listole IRA, and they couldn't really find, you know, someone who would do it. They were quite demoralised, apparently, at the time. You know, the shops had been shut down. There was a lot of activity in Kerry at this time. So another unit from just a small village outside my van or Newtown Sands appears to have been the most hard line of the, the flying columns at the time. They were also involved, for instance, in the death of Arthur Vickers and the burning of his house in, Kil in Kilmorna. So um, they apparently undertook to do the job. Con Brosnan, who went on to play football for Kerry, was one of those who shot the district instructor, inspector. So Vice was walking home uh, on January 20th and Brosnan with two colleagues, Dan Grady and Jack O'Hearn, were kind of waiting outside a pub for their scout, Jack Sheehan, who was going to tell them when um, the RIT man was approaching. When they got the signal, they rushed out of their pistols at the ready and killed him in a hail of bullets. It was only after they fired that they realized that Tobias O'Sullivan was actually holding his five-year-old son by the hand. Thank God the boy was physically unharmed. Now, the interesting thing here is that John Lenehan from Charles Street in Listole was convicted of the murder of Inspector O'Sullivan, along with three other men, Thomas Devereux, Edward Carmody and John Carroll, all of them from Listole or its vicinity. Um, so these men were completely innocent. They had nothing to do with it. You know, the kind of real killers weren't discovered for years later when they gave their testimony to the, the trial, the pension, you know, um, military bureau. They were sentenced to death and only survived because the truce arrived before their sentences were carried out. Um, now, these people, these four men who were innocent, had been kind of implicated by John Kane, who was a fishery inspector, and he was executed by the IRA in about May. Another woman from the stole, Miss Burke, gave this incorrect evidence as well, and she was forced to leave the country not long after it. So you can see, like, the stole is a small town, you know, um, interesting how neighbours, you know, are hearing things or giving incorrect information, but also they would have known that man, you know, um, Inspector O'Sullivan wasn't in the town long, and he was kind of a wanted man. He apparently wore... Um, like a steel vest because he knew, you know, there had been other attempts on his life while he was in the store. So as the world watched and heard stories of atrocities committed against civilians, Britain was increasingly under pressure. In fact, a Dáil Éireann report on propaganda, which the Dáil issued on January 18th, declared that, quote, the British Foreign Office now advises foreign pressmen against coming to Ireland. British embassies have in some cases protested against the news of Ireland and foreign press, and others have gone so far as to refuse visas for passports of pressmen who have written about Ireland. This action of the in English government has been helpful to us. The foreign press makes considerable use of the Irish Bulletin, which was the newspaper kind of that the, the Sinn Féin were circulating and the IRA were circulating. During the last three months, the world's newspapers have given more space to Ireland than in the previous two years. Most of the special articles written have been based on information contained in the Bulletin. And so they had covered extensively, he said, in the last few months, the death of Lord Mayor McSweeney uh, on hunger strike, the reprisals by the Black and Tans, the truth talks and the return of the president. So the return of the president, of course, was de Valera's own return. But the truth talks was, um, I'll talk about it in a minute, there was a few kind of telegrams and public um, outreach from Lloyd George and Father Flanagan. Now, in early January, martial law was extended to several counties. Um, you know, I said Kerry and Cork had already been under it. Um, public meetings like markets and fairs, football matches were banned. All Crown forces in the country were declared to be on active service. And allegedly, anybody found with weapons should suffer death. The British armoured vehicles were up armoured. So they were fitted with armour plates to withstand bombs and bullets and tanks and armoured cars were now used as escorts to the troops in lorries. IRA man James Cahill recalled um, sorry, that the introduction by the British of armour plating and steep sloping with close wire mesh on their vehicles rendered our second timed grenades, sorry, six second timed grenades ineffective because it was impossible to get them into the vehicles because they were now covered with this mesh. So the guerrillas uh, were forced to experiment with even riskier two-second fuses, so that if they hit the truck, you know, and kind of 
bounced off, at least they would fall within the two seconds close to the truck. Or they attached hooks to what were referred to as Mills bombs, and they would hope that the hook would catch in the mesh. So hostages then began to be used by the Crown forces to deter attacks on convoys. And in some cases, prisoners were tied to military vehicles with a notice pinned on them that said, bomb us now. This was continued when foreign journalists in, the, in Dublin in particular reported it. So in a somewhat risky move, British Prime Minister Lloyd George had been involved in the public exchange of telegrams with Father Michael O'Flanagan, who had been the acting president of Sinn Féin and was vice chairperson, over the possibility of halting violence and beginning a no negotiation for peace. A telegram sent by David Lloyd George on the 15th of December stated that the British administration in Dublin Castle would facilitate a meeting with Arthur Griffith, who was behind bars because he had been arrested in late November. Father Flanagan accused Lloyd George of sending messages of goodwill to the people of Ireland publicly, while his government was in intensifying, quote, their fiendish attacks upon our lives, our liberties and our property. And he gave the examples of the burning of Cork, as well as the murders of Canon Magner and Ty Crowley. I think we talked about that last year. He argued that if the British Prime Minister really wished for peace, he would allow the constitution adopted by the Irish people at the last general election to perform its legitimate function. And then they could arrange for a treaty by direct negotiation with the official head of the Irish nation, Eamon de Valera. This, Father Flanagan wrote, is the only possible road to that reconciliation, which is vital to the interests of both nations. So talks stalled following the death of Kevin Barry until the January 6th meeting between Lloyd George and Father Flanagan. And the historian Hopkinson has kind of talked about that. He said that Lloyd George had now moved on to wanting to set up communications with de Valera. Morale was quite low among the British troops at the same time. Um, and so Sir Hammer Greenwood inspected the RIC Auxiliary Division at Beggar's Bush in Dublin on the 22nd of January. He told them, you are here to maintain the United Kingdom intact and to break up that Sinn Féin conspiracy, which has for its object the smashing of the British Empire. A few days earlier on January 16th, Private Alan Bitchford Williams, who was serving with the Ox and Bucks Regiment, took his own life while stationed at Ballyvanar um, military camp, which is in Bottyfund, County Cork. He shot himself in the abdomen and was declared temporarily insane. He was only 18 years of age. Writing in the London Daily News, Robert Lind said, quote, various incidents have shown that the incitements of the weekly summary have had their natural result in making the black and tans feel towards their Irish enemies as men feel towards wild beasts. So this pressure was kind of fomenting all around, you know, civilian and armed forces. Um, a Labour Commission in Ireland also published its, its report in late January, very critical of British government policy in Ireland, especially towards the security policies. It stated that the auxiliaries did not, quote, seem to recognise even the authority of Dublin Castle, and that in creating the Black and Tans, the government had, quote, liberated forces, which it is not at present able to dominate. So aside from the actual fighting, the two major concerns which the Dáil discussed were the Ulster elections and propaganda. Um, on January 13th, de Valera wrote a lengthy memo to Michael Collins on the Ulster six counties. He said that he was in favour of contesting the May election as long as Sinn Féin was sure of winning at least 10 seats. And he requested an, an urgent analysis of electoral figures in the six counties. Collins replied on the 15th, to say that um, the North needed a vigorous policy, including getting counties, Fermanagh and Tyrone, and the city of Derry, as well as town and rural councils to swear allegiance to the Dáil. So they would hope to make partition unworkable over large areas of those six counties. Um, so, you know, Collins, it looks like, was trying to formulate an Ulster policy that would attempt to reduce the partitioned area and make the new state, um, you know, just unviable, non-viable, which was actually the purpose later on, Lloyd George told them, of, you know, not taking the nine counties in Ulster, but just taking six. Now, perhaps more concerning was the fact that de Valera had returned from America and saw for himself the extent of Michael Collins's power. Um, you know, he had a funny relationship de Valera with Brewer and Stack, but it seems Austin Stack and uh, Brewer, Cahill Brewer, who was, don't forget, Minister for Defence. Now, Brewer in particular, it seems, really hated Collins. And so, you know, he would kind of pour poison into de Valera's ear. 
De Valera depressed Collins with his habit of holding up meetings by giving long accounts of his American trips. Undiplomatically, Michael commented on one description of the magnificence in which De Valera had traveled, that had he been there, no such waste would have occurred. Mm -hmm. On another, he interrupted a reminiscence of the chiefs with, oh, I have it off by heart at this stage. The two men had been living such different lives at opposite ends of the spectrum of the Irish drama that it was very difficult for either of them to relate to each other, as Tim Pat Coogan says, even if de Valera had not been embarking on this power struggle. The price which the British had placed on Michael Collins' head was as high as £5,000. It was enough to get him killed several times over in the money values of the time, but completely in insufficient to pay de Valera's hotel bills, imagine. So now de Valera proposes that on the 18th of January that um, maybe Collins should leave the war for a while and go to America. He advanced several reasons for this. One was, quote, we shall not have here, so to speak, all our eggs in one basket. And whatever coup the English may attempt, the line of succession is safe and the future provided for. Now, it would have been a complete disaster, of course, to send Michael Collins in the middle of fighting the War of Independence you know, to America. He wasn't particularly, um, I mean, he was a great speaker, but this would not have suited him like to go and redo the tour that De Valera had just come back from. And don't forget, you were entering the cesspool that De Valera had left after him because the Friends of Irish Freedom and the Association for the Recognition of the Irish Republic, you know, were now at odds with each other. And De Valera... Um, most of the pro de Valera people would have been anti Collins even at that time. So like Devoy would have been a big um, follower like of Colin. Now at the first cabinet meeting since his return, which in and of itself, to be honest, was a disaster. De Valera wanted to do it on the 21st of January, which would have been the anniversary. Of course, it got out, you know, to the British kind of intelligence that this was rumoured to happen. So De Valera and Cahill Brewer didn't turn up and then Michael Collins didn't turn up and they had to change it until the 25th. But, you know, a little bit of a, like, why would you pick that date sort of thing? Um, and so De Valera demands large scale military activities and a reduced level of terrorism which is, you know, to go back to this kind of idea of fighting like they did in 1916, you know, just absolutely uh, kind of unbelievable, really. Uh, de Valera apparently wanted to take over the military as well as political direction of events, despite his humanitarian protestations that he wanted to ease the burden of the people. Really, his concerns, it was clear, were PR driven rather than humanitarian. He told the meeting, that the ambushes and individual shootings were having a bad effect and he wanted hostilities organized on regular military lines. One good battle, he said, involving 500 men from each side every month was apparently what he proposed. Now there was 100 active members of the IRA in Dublin at the time. Uh, and in fairness, the British troops, you know, they were, could have brought in the entire British Empire's army. So exactly like what happened in 1916, you know, you had a, a small groups of men sit and take these areas where they thought they could kind of hold and defend them. And the Helga gunboat was sailed up the Liffey. And within six days, the whole thing was put down. So this was really not workable. And he faced opposition from some of the other members, not just... Um, Collins. So he withdrew this demand upon pressure and says that he would give uh, full support to the IRA, but mandated that it be strictly under government control. And in fact, there seems to be paperwork from Collins that suggests that he had already kind of more or less signed over the authority to the civilian government. But this is a little bit in dispute. Um, now, De Valera's demand about this kind of big, you know, 500 men stand and, and make a stand probably leads to the raid on the Customs House in May, uh, which, of course, was a disaster. And we'll, we'll come to that in May. Now, the church's role in 1921. So we've talked about Father Flanagan. Um, Archbishop Clune of Australia also visited Ireland and, you know, gave testimony to the Pope and to some of the British uh, authorities. His nephew had been killed by the Tans, you know, so he had kind of a first-hand experience and trying to drive the British to the negotiating tables. Um, on January 21st, the Archbishop of Tune, Dr. Gilmartin, wrote of the IRA volunteers who had recently ambushed and wounded some auxiliaries outside Galway. His letter was read at mass throughout Galway 
and he declared the misguided criminals who fired a few shots from behind a wall and then decamped to a safe distance are guilty of a triple crime. They have broken the truce of God. They have incurred the guilt of murder. They have come from outside to do a cold and craven deed. And then having fired their few cowardly shots, they beat a hasty retreat, leaving the unprotected and innocent people at the mercy of uniformed forces. So, you know, there's they're starting to be pushed back amongst Irish people themselves, uh, and particularly, as I say, the church. Now, one of the ministers of the Dáil spent some time in January with the Pope, um, who was Benedict, I think, at the time, and gave him kind of a huge rundown on the civilian atrocities and things perpetuated by the British soldiers. So it looks like they had the blessing, we'll say, or the, at least the silence of um, the Pope. But it's interesting that individual priests were kind of stepping up and, and speaking out. So all in all, January was a very busy month in Ireland for both sides, and of course, months to go before the ceasefire of July. Um, Damien Quinn will give a lecture next month called The War Back Home, a province by province account of the War of Independence, and we'll try and pick up the kind of timeline, you know, thing later on. Now, you can unmute yourselves and I'm just going to show you my PowerPoint. Oh, I forgot I have to share the screen. <laughs> um, God, there's so much to do with this thing. How do I share my screen? Um, God. Hang on now till I... I'm doing more and I'm not getting it. Oh, I just did this last week. Let me hide that. Well, anyway, does anyone have any questions while I figure out how to do this? <laughs> or comments? Oh, share screen. Highlighted in green. Great. Is, is there a... a, a... Oh God, don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> is there a single best book to read? Is it Tim Pat Coogan's or? Uh, oh, well, I mean, I do love Tim Pat. There, there's tons of them, you know, there's a book called Police Casualties in Ireland from 1919 to 1922. Most of the counties have their own specific histories. I, I can't even, I used about three books. I did use, um, Coogan's book to quote some of the things about Jevalera there tonight, the man who was Ireland, the, the biography that he wrote of Jevalera. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, there's uh, today, I was looking through our library today to get some books. I mean, it's incredible how many are published. Mm -hmm. I would look, I think I recommended this book before, The Transformation of Ireland by, oh, sugar, by, um, by who? Dermot Ferreter and Foster and Fanning both have very good books on the War of Independence. They're probably called, you know, the War of Independence or that kind of thing. Um, but I, it's interesting to look at ones that were written more recently. I, I will do up, I keep saying this, I will do up a book list at some point <laughs> for everyone because I do think it's uh, interesting. Um, now, can we, let me see if I can get into a slide share. Mm. So, it, yeah. So here's a picture of Valley Bay um, in Monaghan and possibly some of the IRA men. It, it's hard sometimes to kind of identify, you know, who's with who. And this was RIC in British Army. This was actually taken outside Limerick, I think. Um, now here's some of the burning of Middleton and County Cork. So, you know, there was a number of shops, maybe about seven stores altogether were burnt. Uh, as well as that agricultural place. So there's the that agricultural garage. And so, you know, to get this heavy machinery and stuff, as I say, kind of cripples agriculture in, in small towns. This is another one, the house of Edmund Carey, who it says was chairperson of the Urban Council. Uh, there's a very good, I think I got these from the museum online, the Middleton Museum. Now, this is Dublin. So again, these are not all January of 21, although I tried to get them, but you can kind of see, you know, the, you know, when they're closing off streets and um, kind of randomly sort of searching uh, citizens and civilians, I mean, how difficult, you know, that it was really. Um, God, I hope my screen is not dead, is it? <laughs> no. Oh, no, good. Yeah. Okay, great. Phew. Uh, okay. So we'll go through some of these because I do think they're fascinating. Here's another one like with the tanks being used. So this happened in January around Capel Street, you know, the back of the Four Courts area there. 
Um, here's a black and tan on duty outside Dublin. So, you know, as I said, a lot of kind of waiting around um, because sometimes the attacks, you know, they just blend right back in with, with other civilians. This is, this ha happened in March, but it was, you know, a shootout kind of outside a hotel. And most of these are, are black and tans and auxiliaries, the odd um, RIC. Now, this is Church Street in Dublin, uh, not long after Kevin Barry was arrested. So, you know, actually, as I look at these photographs, what I'm always taken by is how many people, you know, are involved. Um, it's kind of amazing, you know, to see all these bystanders still there. And so you can see some of the police and, and army personnel still back there. And um, this is, you know, civilians being stopped at a checkpoint in Dublin and, and searched. So we said that one of the times that I was talking about Michael Collins, you know, he often went through these checkpoints and would kind of charm the guy. So, he, you know, he changed the subject or he'd offer him a cigarette or, um, you know, often had very incriminating papers, sometimes even weapons, you know, and managed to get by. He cycled most places. Now, these are the men involved with that Falker Bridge attack. Um, Frank Flood, Thomas Byrne, I think Frank Flood was the man who died, Patrick Doyle and Bernard Ryan. And there's the bridge. So, you know, they were kind of lying in wait and then it just all went to pot. And here's Mick Dunn and Sean Burke, uh, two other younger ones involved. This is an example of one of the notes that was left on somebody who had been accused um, and convicted, you know, by, by the IRA. Uh, so they would leave a note like this on the body. Um, this is the Kirby. Um, so here's the execution order. And, and just talking about, this is from the military bureau. If anyone is into this, that is an amazing treasure trove. Like some of these records are 40, 50 pages long, you know, they're all online, uh, military B history bureau or something like that. I, I have to Google it again, but you can, you know, you can search by name or by people. So if any one of ye, you know, if your people had a story and, and gave it to the Irish government to collect their pensions, it'll be in there probably. Um, some of them are transcribed or this old fashioned, you know, kind of typing. And then this was the newspaper account of his body when he was found, remember in 1990. Uh, this is Tobias O'Sullivan, the RIC man who was shot in the stole while walking with his son. And now this got massive coverage in the newspapers throughout Dublin. Um, I think particularly because, you know, he'd been walking with his child. So one of the headlines there says that at his funeral, uh, his son, um, let me read it there. There was a pathetic scene at the graveside, the last post having been sounded, the bereaved relatives were taking a last look at the coffin when the murdered police officer's little son, John, who was with him at the time, he was shot, cried out, daddy, daddy, bringing tears to the eyes of many present. Owing to the gravedigger strike, the grave had to be dug and filled by policemen. So he was um, buried in Dublin, actually, in Glasnevin. Uh, did I say Glasnevin? I'm not sure if it's Glasnevin. So this is, and again, all of this is available uh, through the military bureau as well, but this is one of the pages of his inquest and this is his um, headstone. So, you know, interesting that, again, four innocent men were convicted of doing it. Here's Father Flanagan uh, around the time, you know, that he was in the Dáil. And there's that proclamation expanding martial law to Clare, Kilkenny, Waterford, the city of Waterford and Wexford. And so, you know, by now, like half the country is under martial law. This was one of the handwritten notes from Father Flanagan. There's a ton of um, the transcripts of the cables and things, you know, because it was covered in the press. It was like not, uh, not a secret at all that they were trying to get, you know, somebody together to have a talk. Um, okay, where am I gone? Uh, now, so this is Hammer Greenwood inspecting the recruits. And, uh, you know, I was saying to you that, like, morale was very low. So he went to the Beggar's Bush in particular, um, you know, barracks to have a look at them. Here's Michael Collins and De Valera. So, you know, tensions are starting to kind of niggle between the two boys, uh, definitely. And then there's Archbishop Clune from Australia, who was... Um, very involved in these talks with, you know, trying to kind of open up the dialogue between the English and the Irish, but particularly the politicians. And then there's Reverend Dr. Thomas Gilmartin, who issued the um, the letter condemning the, the uh, IRA activity. So, um, interesting times, you know, January 21, there isn't long more to go, sort of for the war, but it was definitely heating up. 
Does anyone have any questions or comments? I'm going to check our Facebook page too now. Sorry to go out here, but. Um, the Upper Hudson Library System has the, don't look at me, <laughs> has that uh, book, the Dermot Ferreter. It's 884 pages long. <laughs> Um, but then we also, Bob and I have the, uh, what is it, the Encyclopedia of the Irish Revolution that UC Cork did. And um, I'll, I'll pick it up and I'll look at a part of it, but you know, it weighs as much as I do. Is there yeah. anything a little shorter? <laughs> nah, there probably isn't. Well, some of them are very... Um, yeah, but I, I, I like detail. I, I just, I, I think I st I'm 70 years old and I still think like a student, you know? Yeah. So it's like, I'm going to learn all of this, <laughs> all 884 pages. Sorry, I'm live on Facebook as well as here. I don't know why I've done that to myself. Mm. Okay, good. Sorry, there were, we had an echo because I just wanted to check if people were commenting on Facebook or asking questions. Uh, no, some of the books are tiny, Mary Beth. Um, Foster's is not that big and you know because there's a few that really only deal with the war as opposed to you know the fallout and, and all the other things so um I'll have a look tomorrow I'm sure it's Foster's that is only about this size what the transformation of Ireland that I recommended actually deals with the entire century so like it would only be a couple of chapters because he does it decade by decade so okay. you know you could read that bit that's pertinent and then forget the rest of it that it's a very good book you know because he's a little bit um I would say kind of critical or certainly open to, you know, the fact that, for instance, like the, the new government, uh, and we talked about this when we talked about women last week, you know, they don't kind of follow through with the democratic program of 1918 or anything like that. So he's a bit more um, critical kind of, or, or clear eyed, as opposed to saying it's all, you know, um, that, oh, we got our independence. So now we're a haven, you know, for Irish people. Yeah. Uh, Patricia on Facebook asked, no, sorry, Peter, were there any areas that were notably quiet during the War of Independence? Um, well, you know, there are probably pockets, I suppose, we don't, or certainly I have never looked at that, you know, to see like where was not affected, but I mean, there, there kind of must have been, you know, there definitely was activity, I would say, in almost every county. Um, but some of them stand out, you know, so Cork was massive, Kerry was massive, um, you know, the north, we've looked at the last two months, pockets in the north, very large, but, you know, there was riots in Belfast, you know, so it's not, it, it really, I don't think any place went untouched, because even if there was no activity, maybe in your own county, probably men and women from that county, you know, joined a flying column somewhere else. So, I mean, I wonder places like Roscommon, you know, and Westmeath and, and kind of poor or out of the way counties. But, you know, there was a lot of activity in Galway. Um, so like maybe more rural or more, you know, just harder to get for the British, <laughs> you know, maybe there might have been less activity there. But, you know, the big thing was right from 1919, they, they do take over some of the RIC barracks and it just kind of snowballs from there. So depending, on, you know, it, it kind of was driven by the British presence in one way. Um, I don't think we have any more. Elizabeth? Uh-huh. Now this is Karen Hess, um, Andy, oh, sitting, Karen. Uh, Andy sitting next to me. And one of the pictures that you had mm -hmm. um, showed all of the children in the front lines. Um, yeah. And I, I was just, that was so striking to me because yeah. the men were holding bayonets. Yeah. Um, were children used often as some kind of a no man's land or or a protection or how why was I that i think that they were deliberately used i'm going back to find it this seems to me like that maybe you know a, a checkpoint was set up at the wrong time like because there are so many children you know maybe they're coming home from school or you know that kind of thing um now there was huge amounts of um children killed during 1916 for instance you know um particularly at certain like the, those houses that were kind of demolished you know by the british so civilians have always paid the price and and they do in this war too but i don't think it's that the children were you know used i think probably you know it must be near a school 
or near something where kids would have kind of flocked out to see what was happening you know and didn't have the sense maybe to go home you know like you can see it, it's obviously kind of a working class see this kid here is barefoot and over here too so I'm sure it's down there around Capel Street or um, where they had put up those barriers but I, I think the kids just happened to be in the neighborhood as well. Okay. So it wasn't a deliberate. I don't think so. No, no. Certainly, I, I have never read, you know, that the IRA would have used that as a tactic, like to, you know, gather up the children to kind of clear the way for them to be safe, you know. I don't think that would have happened. Good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, anyone else got any questions? I'm just my cousins, uh, my cousins say that uh, the black and tans would come to the house. They're from County Mead south mm -hmm. of Dublin mm -hmm. and uh, they would come to the house and tear it all apart and say they thought they had guns in there but they didn't and uh, their mother was widowed and was she had nine children and she they said they just hung on her skirts and waited until they got through yelling yeah. at them and you know accusing them of all kinds of things yeah and that oh, was I mean a long the way civilian population were terrorized yeah, yeah there's no doubt about that you know um, I mean, in, in our hometown, so I was saying, you know, the IRA were kind of dispirited, like there's a gun, a bullet hole in my grandmother's um, fireplace. We didn't live in that building at the time, but, uh, you know, they were shooting across the roofs at, at the barracks behind the house. And so, you know, and like I think I've told the story before, my great grandmother was hauled out of her house eight months pregnant, you know, and, and they dragged her out into the yard and, and kind of shouted for my great grandfather, Mulvell, you know, we know you're there and and put pulled the trigger of the gun while it was in her mouth, you know, but there there was no bullet in there. But you know, so this kind of thing happened all the time. They they would interrupt funerals, you know, there was another just in the stall a funeral was happening and the body was lying on um a door that was balanced on two chairs and they just overthrew, you know, mm -hmm. threw the body out of the coffin and onto the floor. So it was I mean, you know, certainly with the IRA um, or with the auxiliaries and the black and tans, I mean, like there was no Geneva Convention rule, <laughs> you know, it was very much a kind of a, and I, I suppose it was because particularly in rural, it was more difficult in Dublin, but you know, the men were living in bogs and, and you know, the town were somehow sustaining them or these little villages. So, you know, we talked about it the, the time we did women, women would go out into the countryside with food, you know, they would try to provide safe haven if men were on the run, you know, and the other thing that strikes me every time I read these things is how young the men are. Yeah. Like, you know, it's 18, 19, it, it's not, you know, sort of 40 dead. year old men, it's young boys, you know, and I'm sure they were, you know, grown men too, because of course they would have had some military experience maybe, or, you know, there might've been World War One vets and things. But it's, there's an awful lot of youngsters, you know, like that really might not have known much about anything, you know. And so I, I always find that, you know, so you can imagine like a, a country house out in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. to see These young 17, 18 year old boys coming in, like, of course, they would shelter them, you know. Yeah. And yeah. that was the thing, yeah. I think, that, that changed this war from the 1916. 1916, like Dublin was annoyed, you know, they were being bombed. Uh, there was looting going on, you know, the civilian population were way more killed than, you know, combatants on either side. And it wasn't until all those signatories were killed and, you know, James Connolly tied to a chair, you know, when those stories started to filter out, it's when the sympathy turned. But by 1919, the civilian population really are, you know, kind of wanting the Brits out. And maybe the, you know, had the auxiliaries and black and tans not behaved the way they behaved there might have been like fatigue among the civilian population earlier but this kind of just makes them dig in you know like that yeah we have to get these guys out because look at how they're treating us so it was kind of an interesting you know from a PR perspective it really failed um anyone else questions or comments it was amazing to me when I, there's a, a wiki, you know, um, that does the timeline and it is amazing how many things happened in January. Like it was really hard to narrow it down, you know, so I, I can imagine, you know, the politicians in, in Britain and even, the, you know, the Lord Lieutenant in Ireland and all of these forces must have been driven absolutely demented because there was probably telegrams coming in, you know, from all corners of the country every day with this has happened and this has happened and you know, one disaster after another. And the IRA, you know, sometimes it's small gains, like it's a couple of rifles or, a, you know, a few bombs or they dismantle kind of a, 
you know, they, they might set on fire like to a, a barracks. It's not like they're, you know, gaining huge ground with every time, with every raid, but it, it must have been um, fairly significant in terms of, you know, how to deal with it from a leadership perspective, because really it was unrelenting. January through June sort of is, is unrelenting now. Mm. So, well, uh, but I also think it's interesting, you know, that now the devil ear is back, what that means and, and the kind of changes that we're going to see, because the, the jealousies among the personalities like of the doll, you know, really kind of come to the fore. And it, it's so funny that in the middle of all of this war, like, and I, I do think it, Tim Pat Coogan's biography, which is huge, <laughs> Devon era, but it's really good. It's um, The Man Who Was Ireland. Mm. It, you know, it's, Devon era seems to have had, even as events were happening, like one eye on posterity, you know, even at the time. And so it's very interesting, like, you know, he, his little notes that he writes and, you know, he has this very faithful secretary who documents everything. And, and I read her book, too, about being with him in America. And it's, you know, like sometimes he's doing one thing, but saying another, you know, and it's very, it's very telling, I think, uh, in terms of, you know, what they were ready for. Peter says, weren't they holding on by the skin of their teeth before the truth? They were, Peter, yeah. So, um now, this is vaguely debated, too. I'm not sure, actually, if it came up in, in Coogan's book or another book. Um, what I was, for sure, there was a will on the behalf of the population to keep it going. So that's always interesting. You know, you know there was no kind of clamour for peace from the Irish. But apparently, like, they are down to weeks worth of bullets, you know. Mm. Um, the, you know, the money is held up in America, so they, they don't get that. They're buying guns from um, Hibernians in Glasgow. <laughs> but, yeah. like, the money is not being released by, to be honest, by De Valera and by, um, even though Michael Collins is Minister for Finance, you know, Austin Stack is Minister for the Home kind of state. And so it's interesting, like, the money situation isn't really being freed up and... Uh, their arms supply is seriously dwindling by June. But on the other side of it uh, is the fact that Britain are really losing the PR, you know, battle in terms of the the, the world's media. Uh, Damien says, did I mention the Lethal Mutiny? I did a game changer. So we, we covered that in a previous lecture, but then today we covered the repercussions of that um, when Tobias O'Sullivan was killed because he had replaced the um, the previous staff. So oh, anyone got anything else? Caroline says it's like Jerry in the 70s. Yeah, I think she's referring to the picture particularly of the barricades in Dublin. Yeah, I would say that's exactly what it's like, you know, to take over a city like that. And you imagine, you know, if they put up checkpoints at the bottom of State Street here, you know, that you have to go through every time you go to work. It, it's very, um, you know, very intimidating, I think, to the local population. There must have been whole generations of kids who grew up never, you know, without any peaceful days to look back on. And, and yeah. you know, with PTSD, before there was a diagnostic a name for it. manual, you know, the, yeah. the study of it. And yeah. Robert Cole's books, Children in Crisis, um, those would have been a natural for him. So, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Rita. My um, my grandmother used to tell the story. She was born in 21, so she didn't, you know, grow up through it. Um, but she knew, like, her teacher, who actually I think I might have mentioned last week, was shot through the arm. She put up a hand to defend her husband. Her husband was shot. And, you know, and like Nana saw, you know, her bullet wound, you know, and, and used to talk about that all the time, you know. So it's very interesting, like, as you say, what children remember and... and um, you know, yeah, it is. It's an interesting thing. Um, thanks, Jean and Bob. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you all enjoyed it. But it was faster than I thought it was going to be, which was great. <laughs> Sometimes I can meander on. So uh, I'll get the newsletter out in the next couple of days. February is jam packed, and March jam packed. Of course, we'll be doing. We can't really do our our soda bread competition this year, you know, because they're just how would we do it hygienically? Uh, so. Harold Quarters and I are going to live stream from his house. Harold's teaching me how to bake soda bread because I am not from a, a baking family. <laughs> My That one grandmother was good and the other grandmother makes beautiful apple tarts, but we don't make our own bread. 
And so um, that'll be fun, <laughs> I hope. And uh, we'll do that. And we are doing our run. So if anybody wants to do a virtual 5K or 10K run, those are available. You can register now and do it that week. So, um, yeah. Virtual walk. I know, yeah, yeah. I might even do it this year because it's virtual. <laughs> but um, I think that, yeah, the Irish military history archives are online, so that's where to go. Yeah. Uh, my father says that my mother is a great baker, but to be honest, we wouldn't know because she never bakes. He used to make brown bread, actually. <laughs> He's watching on Facebook. He used to make brown bread and banana bread for a few years there, but uh, has given up, it seems. <laughs> So thanks very much, everyone. I'll let you go and um, we'll keep an eye. Yeah, it's great to see you all, even though it's, you know, this way. And, uh, I'm right. getting my hair cut on Saturday, so I'm thrilled. Oh. <laughs> and no, colored. I'm very quiet. <laughs> but uh, I'll see you all soon next. I think February 1st, we might do something, but I, I'll tweet it out there and, and Instagram it before we decide. So definitely we have a Triskelly concert on the, set, the 6th, Saturday oh. night, the 6th. So I, I'll send everyone that. That'll be brilliant. Yeah. Good. Okay. So thanks very much, everybody. Have a great night and thank you for joining. Thank you. Take thank care. Bye-bye. Bye, Sandy. <laughs> Glad you logged in too. How do I do this here? Stop video. Chat. I can shut it down for everyone now. I get myself off of here. I know. <laughs> thanks, Sandy.